but this is a very special moment for us and I'm very pleased to be here to have the Goa launch of a very special book. Um, as you know, throughout this festival we've been having book launches and we've also been discussing food. One big reason for that is the presence of Naomi Dugood. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi, for coming all the way from Canada for this. It has been a great privilege to discuss all the various aspects of food with Naomi. Um, I urge you to follow her on uh, social media and also check out her books, which are available as e-books as well. They are remarkable, unique books. Uh, they are highly acclaimed and award-winning. They are on various aspects of food culture, different parts of the world, as well as different aspects of food. They are unique. Um, and today we are discussing the latest book, which is uh, written uh, uh, by herself. It's, uh, it's an amazing book. I have a copy myself. It's called Burma Rivers of Flavor. Um, it is, uh, uh, like all of our other books, it's a, it's a tremendous work of scholarship. Um, it's also written with tremendous verb and it's presented in a remarkable fashion. Um, today to, to, to discuss the book is someone who doesn't need much of an introduction anymore to the Arts and Literary Festival, that is Samar Halankar. Uh, Samar, besides writing on food, and I hear a very popular column on food in, the, in Mint, is also um, with India Spend, which is now an invaluable resource uh, in the media and also a kind of an independent watchdog in many different ways. I urge you to follow him um, on social media and also check out India Spend. <coughs> Um, I don't normally do this, but the pro forma is to stand up for a photo and uh, present the book. This one I would like to join, uh, if you don't mind. So, presenting Burma Rivers of Flavor with Naomi Dugood. Thank you. Good morning. I think the really unfortunate thing is, of course, that we don't have the book uh, here. I think there were problems in getting it across um, continents so to say. Um, but we have Naomi, which is the second best thing. Um, and let me first say uh, and I, that before I got here, I wasn't, uh, I didn't know who Naomi was. And uh, I've just realized how much I've missed uh, after I've uh, read this book. Now this is first of all really remarkable because I have piles and piles of cookbooks, travel books at home. And uh, this really is one of the best that I've ever read. Uh, that's because it is all about food, travel, cuisine, culture, and it does a remarkable job at that. But I think the great strength is that it is an excellent <coughs> primer uh, on the country itself, uh, Burma. Uh, and uh, she will tell you why she uses Burma instead of Myanmar, and there are um, strategic, strategic geopolitical reasons for that, which she will tell you why. Uh, but I think it is just remarkable because I've, I've been reading this since I laid my hand on this two days ago, and I've got this great insight into Myanmar, um, and, and it's much better than I have had from many other uh, political books as well. Uh, let me begin by uh, asking you, uh, Naomi, uh, what drives you to travel and do the kind of books you do? By the way, this is her seventh book, and the eighth book is on its way uh, next year. And the eighth book is her travels through uh, Iran, uh, Azerbaijan, and the old Central Asian republics. And she has she has tremendous stories to tell from those as well. So let me just ask what drives you to travel, you know, in this case for us, really on by riverboat, uh, on share taxis without shock absorbers and uh, braving judgmental men, I'm sure, above all. It's interesting uh, what drives me to travel. I'm just curious about how things work in the world. And um, I live in a place where um, people have come Oh, I have to say, you haven't had this experience with me, any of you, but I, I, when I'm emotional, I tear up. <laughs> so, <Oops. laughs> don't worry, it's fine, it just, it passes. But it's kind of amazing to me to be here talking about Burma, because it'll go away. Just, sorry, just ignore it for a minute, or anyway, I'll talk through it. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to be here talking about Burma, because there's such a connection with this whole region. And one of the things about Burma is that it is kind of a place between, you know, between Southeast Asia, East Asia. It borders on Bangladesh, India, China, and Thailand, and, and the Andaman Sea. I mean, it's really a keystone if you look at the map and put, instead of putting sort of 
the, the wedge of India in the middle of your map. If you put the long kind of, it's like a kite with a long tail, if you put that shape, the shape of Burma, in the middle of your, of your map, you see uh, where it borders, and you see why it would be a place where there would be fighting. So why do I travel? I, I actually travel because I'm curious about how people live, and I, I like to hang around. I don't like moving through places. I like being in places, and, and I like hanging around. So, so writing about Burma, for example, <laughs> required a lot of hanging around, because when I started the book, it was a totalitarian state. It still is, actually although they've had an election. And people were very cautious, very fearful. And so it was necessary to just really not need anything from people, but just to hang around. And so it, it became an exercise in patience, actually. But that's sort of how I travel anyway, is to just hope that I'll have a contact or a conversation, um, take photographs in markets, and uh, try to understand what people are shopping for, and then See, uh, see what grows outside town. Try and understand who's there, you know. Um, and food is a great way to understand what goes on. You just watch the daily pattern. Everybody has to eat, and it's home cooking. It's that food that's most interesting to me. And who's buying what, you know. And they, when I was in, in the north, for example, food can be a, a guide in a place where there aren't other guides. So I was in Michina, which is in Kachin State in the north, and I was bicycling, I found a bicycle to, to rent, borrow at the Y where I was staying, a little place by the rail station. And I suddenly smelled mustard oil. It's just not a smell I, you know, cooking mustard oil. It's not a smell I associated with Southeast Asia, certainly not at all. And I thought, I wonder who that is? Who could that be? And uh, I went back and said, well, are there, are there Bengalis? What? And he said, no, Gurkhas. And so, ah, well, why were they there? Oh, well, it turns out they were there because during the Second War, of course, there was a great movement back and forth of people. And so they call them Gurkhas. They're, they're not necessarily, but they're Nepalis. And so they're cooking with mustard oil. And so, but it was my nose and it was the cooking that told me about the Gurkhas. I wouldn't have ne otherwise necessarily spotted them or known anything. So it's for those wonderful kind of moments that I travel, I think. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that stuff that kind of, Oh, that's interesting. Oh, then that leads me down a path. It's really fun. So I think this is the it's fun, basically, is what I do. What I, I think this is the remarkable thing that she doesn't go in and seek out uh, proper chefs and celebrity chefs, etc. She uh, appears to show up in marketplaces, uh, uh, by the, on riverbanks, etc., and start talking to people, and then um, uh, slowly eases her way into the culture, cuisine, and people's lives. Um, there's, there's a chapter here, for example, called Travels with Sai. And Sai appears to be a tea shop owner, am, yeah. I, am I right? Yeah. And um, there's a whole chapter on that, and or, or apparently Sai, I think, just took charge of her, and they hit it off and uh, was a guide for the next few days. So, And there's a whole chapter and a whole loads of recipes that she gleaned uh, from traveling with Sai. Would you like to tell us how well, this works? Uh, how, do you, how do you show up? But it, it, not, it, I didn't get recipes from him. It was just the story. Yeah, it's just sure. the story. But no, I well, I was hanging around. I was in a, a place called Pa'an, which is in uh, Shan State. And um, you have to understand, when I started the book, yes, Burma was in very sort of a kind of lockdown feeling. So people were very cautious. And then when you go outside the central area of Burma, uh, into the Shan State, the Kachin State, so on, it's even sort of tighter because, of course, there are I don't know. From the Burmese government's point of view, they're insurgencies. From the local point of view, they're kind of a, an assertion of um, a, autonomy, not necessarily independence movements. It's just don't mess with any kinds of movements because the, there's a very heavy hand of the army. Anyway, and I was in Pa'an, which is uh, which is one of the, the Shan princely was one of the Shan princely states, and this guy and, and he's uh, so he's a South Asian looking guy, sort of. Big tall guy though, so he was out of scale. I mean, he had sort of—he was sort of Punjabi scale guy, if I can put it that way. Um, and um, is that all right? And um, and uh, with the anyway, this white bit quite outstanding. And I had a tea, and he started to talk, and he spoke English. And it turned out his father, also another war story, his father had ended up there because he'd been there during the war. And uh, and I just told him I was interested interested in food. 
food. And he said, well, um, yeah, I can take you around on my motorcycle. And so I went, got in the back of his motorcycle and we went to a place where people were, were processing sugar and another place where people were um, boiling salt. You know, there's, a, there's salt springs there and they, they boil the water down and extract salt. And, you know, it was just, it was just uh, extraordinary. And, and he told me about his father and about how his father had um, had a yogurt. He produced yogurt and cheese, but nobody wanted the yogurt. It's Shan State. People don't eat milk products. And so he said, I think that's why I'm big and tall, because I had to eat all my father's yogurt that nobody wanted to buy. I mean, you know, it was a jokey kind of a thing, but it was also quite, quite real. And he'd stayed there. You know, he'd grown up there, and that was his, and he'd married a Shan woman. Um, but these little glimpses of the past, uh, you know, were just, they're just such a privilege, right? And you, because when we think about a country, we think of it as sort of a unity. I mean, you, as if most of you who are from India, you know it's not at all a unity, it's a complexity. But when you think of a place that you're not from, you first of all think of it as a clean outline and, oh, Burma, right, Burmese, right. No, it's as, like as India is, it's complex and there's all this history and there's all these different people with different historical stories and different agendas in the present, you know. And again, food, you know, all it takes is one thing to be interested in. I'm, I mean, I could be interested in music, or you know, there's ethnomusicologists going around looking at that, but, but food is much easier because everyone's eating every day. So I, I don't, you don't have to look far. It's there, but yeah. Talking about everybody eating every day, but this is just what we when you have somebody coming home, the tendency is, okay, I've got a guest coming, so I wear my best Sunday. Uh -huh. That goes to the, the dress up, yes. Yeah. So I probably, instead of, you know, dressing up a leftover, um, make something special. That, yeah, do you think that? Well, mostly I'm not, I'm not even, it's more casual than that even. So, so it, yeah, I mean, I'm hanging around in tea shops and then people chat to me. I might end up in somebody's house, um, maybe not. I mean, in Burma that was also a tricky thing until later on people, they could get in trouble. So it would only be somebody who already was dealing with foreigners who would, because otherwise the police or the army would come and question them about what were you doing talking to that foreigner, what did you say to them, and oh no, it, it really was very heavy for people. Oh yeah, so not, not at all, oh, to come to my house. Now that's much more possible. And I have Burmese friends now, and I eat at their houses, and you know, and we cook together. But um, no, in the beginning, it was it was it really did take patience, because and there's no way I would want to push because they're the ones at risk. So, see what I mean? So it's it's really a it was it was a very slow process. Let me just very quickly read a paragraph from the preface that really tells you. Uh, how actually difficult this was. I think she kind of glosses over it because she's been in the middle of it, but to us from outside, as outsiders, this will tell you how uh, difficult it was. My first trip, trip to Burma was in 1980. Nine years later, I went from Thailand into a border area controlled by the Karen Independence Army. And in 1998, I traveled to Shan State and Mandalay. Since starting work on this book in late 2008, I've made many more trips into Burma. I've spent time in Rangoon, but also have been able to travel widely across the country. I've slowly gained an understanding of the local food by hanging around, photographing, eating, and eating in markets, tea shops, small restaurants, and having conversations with people. That, I think that gives you an idea of what the, of the effort that's gone into this book. But this, the book is very well organized into, from a culinary point of view, into soups, salads, curries, etc. So if you've just been hanging around and uh, organically following people. How did this organization come? It's a very clear organization. And how do you do that? Do you go and say, okay, uh, this visit I'm going to do only soups. I'm going to do salads. <laughs> no. How does that work? No, it's it's entirely random. It's more, I each time I would think, this could be my last trip into Burma because speaking of applying for visas, um, when I would apply, I'd think, okay, maybe next time I'll get refused. So I had to think each time, or if this is my last trip in, or they might think I'm a journalist. I'm not a journalist, but the journalists were on the blacklist, right? So uh, I was just going in as just, you know, a tourist. I would apply for my visa in Thailand and then go in. And um, so, uh, yeah, so I, my first trips were the, to the farthest away, most remote places. Because I thought, okay, I'm going to get to the places that are, if they're open now, let me grab them. 
you know, and then slowly, so I didn't get to Bagan, which is the famous place with the ruins that's so fabulous. I didn't go there till very late on, because it was the, the easiest. If anything's gonna be open to tourism, it's gonna be Bagan. So let me go to, uh, for example, Rakhine State, where now it's, it's been closed intermittently because of the Rohingya issue that's complex. Um, Kachin State also has been closed intermittently. So I went to those first. So how about organization? Well, at a certain point, I'm just gathering. And I'm trying not to think about how messy my gathering is. And after about a year, I start to do an inventory. And I think, oh, I'm OK on soups. Boy, I'm really like, and I'm rich in salads. That chapter is going to dominate the book, because Burmese salads are extraordinary. Uh, mm, I'm a little light on fish. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, and I start to get a little panicky, maybe, about this or that. And then I think, well, maybe if I reorganized it this way so that you couldn't tell how light it was on this, then I, you know. So that's how the organization sort of comes. And eventually, things kind of take shape. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's really it. And I wanted geographic distribution in terms of recipes, too. I wanted to make sure you had a real taste of Kachin food and Shan food, both of which are fabulous and completely distinct from central Burmese. Um, and I have a few recipes from the south, not as many as I'd like. Um, but it was really like that. And Dawe, which is a town way down the tail of the kite, not right at the bottom, but way down. It's due west of Bangkok. It's only 120 or 150 kilometers due west of Bangkok, a city of over 10 million. There's the border. There isn't a road. They're building a road. Dawe at the moment is Sleepy Hollow. And it's going to be not Sleepy Hollow in two seconds in the blink of an eye once they built that road across. Um, and so I wanted to get down there, but there were no planes. And there's no, the road is closed because of insurgency. So you have to fly, right, the road from Rang Rangoon. So you have to fly there from Rangoon. And uh, then they started an airline that was flying there. Before then, it was only military planes. And so finally, when this airline started, so that's what it was like traveling. It was sort of like, oh, I hear there's a new airline. Yes, it started last week. Oh, and they're flying to Dawei. Oh, let me get a ticket. And you know, I'd leap on the plane. And so when I got to Dawei, the guy at the airport said, where are you staying? Little airport, little hut. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I <laughs> know, I'm just. And he was very upset because he had his, it was like, it was like booking a plane here 30 years ago. He had his list, you know, and it had to, everything had to be written down and I had to be registered. And, and so I looked around and there was a guy there who was, who had made, who was from Rangoon, but he was doing business already, starting people had started to buy real estate for hotels, because they're thinking this road is going to go through. So there's all speculation already. And he said, oh, here's the name of a hotel. And so I could give the guy the name of a hotel. I mean, that's how basic it was. I'm sure if you go to Dawei now, because that was five years ago, I'm sure it's, it's booming. Real estate has probably tripled. You know, it's just, it's. So in Dawei, I found a, a recipe for Mohinga. Whoa, a whole different way of making mohinga, which is the morning soup. And suddenly my soups chapter, my noodles chapter work was, you know, enriched and I suddenly thought, okay, now I don't have to worry, I'm fine. You know, so it was like that sort of feeling fragile in certain areas in the chapters, feeling skimpy, and then, oh, enriched. And I could never tell what was going to come next. So that's why I didn't do the inventory until quite late on. Soups, as you say, in fact, since you mentioned soups, are a very important part of the cuisine. And she says that the Burmese often uh, have, or always have soup with their meals and keep sipping it through the meal, uh, almost as a replacement for it's water. It's your liquid. It's your, it's your drink. It's, it's a clear soup. Is that something like the also No, it's, it's almost more like, you know how you have rasam in yeah. the south? It's a little bit like rasam, but it's not as intense as that. It's, it's not doing that give you appetite thing. It's only, it's just a liquid. It's like a very clear soup, sort of almost more Chinese style, but not at all Chinese. I mean, yeah, I you know, know, yeah. You talked of uh, Burma being at the confluence of South and Southeast Asia. Uh, what flavors and spices have traveled across the border? I noticed turmeric, I noticed uh, ground peanut, and I noticed dried fish that I could associate with. Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting because there's fish sauce, so that's like a, like a a Thai Khmer thing, and yet, but the thing that makes it very uh, South Asian and not at all Southeast Asian, in other words, the thing that's strange to Thai 
people from Thailand who come, is that I think everything starts with heating oil, and it's usually uh, it's either sesame oil, you know, it's gingerly oil, or it's or it's peanut oil, because they have both, and they have a lot of peanuts in the dry center of the country, and then a lot of chopped shallot or onion. So that's the base with a pinch of turmeric. So that's it's very that feels very South Asian to me. Um, but then you go on from there to flavor things with um, fermented fish product, maybe to give some umami underneath flavor. And then there's a lot of raw as well. The salads are, are dressed with lime juice and um, there's maybe toasted uh, ground peanuts in them. There's crunch and, and freshness. So they'll take, Burmese will say to you proudly, Central Burmese, oh, we make a salad out of anything. You know, if we have samosas, if we buy samosas, and then we have leftover, then we just take scissors they, and, they, and they cut everything in the, in the street stalls with scissors, not with knives. So if they're cutting tomatoes, they use scissors. It's really interesting. Yeah, I know, you're all looking puzzled, but it's really weird. And the first time I saw it, I thought, what? Am I, you know, is this just this person? No, it's everybody. So the tomatoes are quite, you know, it's dry often, so the tomatoes are not very liquid. You know, there's those quite solid plum tomatoes, and they're using scissors to cut them. Uh, and then they'll take the samosa, they'll cut it into some pieces, and then dress it with lime juice and, uh, again, roasted uh, chopped peanuts, some maybe a little tiny bit of shallot oil that you fried the shallots in, and the fried shallots as well, then some fresh herbs. Um, and the whole thing then is this burst of flavor that's got a bit of tart, not much sweet, um, and then the crunch of the onions is the sweet. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. So there's this this sort of fresh thing that goes on a lot. And it's a different way of nothing wasted. And the meal is a standard lunch if you go out just eating outside, but with any, uh, lunch is the big meal, noontime meal. And uh, people eat a very little, you'll have a very little bit of some kind of curry, maybe a meat curry, maybe not. And then a fish and maybe a fried fish. And then every meal comes with two or three condiments sort of like chutneys, but they're different. They're often a fermented fish sort of paste, and, and then the soup, and then a big um, plate of fresh herbs. So you're on, if I'm on my own, it was really a problem, because even if I ordered only one dish at a roadside stand in a, on a bus trip, we stop for lunch, everybody goes out and orders, I'd end up with, there'd be six things in front of me. I, I mean, they're little, but it's still sort of, you always want to be in company when you're eating Burmese food in Burma, because, and you want to eat your big meal at noon, even if it's hot and you're not ready, you just do that, because that's when the really good food is. But if you're in company, then you, you can share. And, but you just take what you need uh, and, and leave the rest. Um, you serve yourself from the center, you take a little and put it on your plate, and then you eat it on your rice. So you get served your rice. So it, it, there's a combination of that feeling in South India of the rice is there, and then you put, take what you need, but it's, it's very Burmese, it's just different again. I think you'd find it very interesting. And you'd, some of it would feel a bit, if you're not going, would feel fishier to you than you might want, but not necessarily, you know? I spent a long time on uh, the last bit of this book. This is about 50 pages. And this essentially is the primer to Burma, and this is wonderfully written. And it really gives you an idea of uh, the political, uh, political and social complexities of the of, of the country. Of course, there's a glossary of all kinds of ingredients that go in. But apart from that, there's everything that you need to know. The fact that um, the the democracy movement which began in uh, 1988 was called 8888, uh, and it was named after that. So it's from those minute details uh, to the script and how that script evolved, which really made this book um, unique uh, as far as I'm concerned. How long does it take to get to put this together? And you have you have a uh, annotated bibliography, and there are quite a few impressive references. There's so obviously you've done quite a bit of reading. Well, it you know it just I think some people are really orderly, and they have a plan, and they and they have dates, and they have due dates, and I kind of work on all phases at once, and then slowly hope that it's coming together, and then I see where my gaps are. Again, like the recipe collection. So my favorite bit is the, doing the glossary and the, I mean, at some level it's a favorite because it's at the end and it's a way of pulling together all the threads that are in the book. And it's, 
the bib annotated bibliography is also a treat thing to do because it's the things I discover. Oh, I've read all of those things. Oh, that's interesting. And then I can put a little note in about it. It's not a formal bibliography. It, it's just a... So it's, it's all trying to... Because keep in mind that I'm writing mostly, I'm thinking of my audience as people in North America for whom Burma is really the other side of the world. And a place that, when I started the book, was a black hole for them, notionally. So I'm trying to make it friendly and available to them in various ways. So this book is kind of an attempt at, it's also a bit of a seduction, right? So look at the cover. I mean, it's, it's trying to pull people in and say, hey, you can do this. This is an interesting place. Tune in, pay attention, read this novel, make this dish, look at this picture. Whatever it is that, you know, gets people started is my, you know, but I don't know how long it takes. It takes as long as it takes. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, so that question. Okay. So, you know, the country is formally called uh, Myanmar now, um, and it was called, there's a whole thing of, you know, we're talking about transliterating scripts. So, Bama, Bama is, the, is basically the, the name of the people, of the central people who came down originally sort of, they're not Chinese at all, but came down from China uh, long, long ago and pushed the Mon people south. So the Mon were the ones who had the Buddhism first, and then the Bamar encountered it. And then it got sort of brought up into the center of the country where the kings were. Um, and so, but you can also read that script as Mema or Bama. I mean, it's really, so, all right. So that's the argument, and people will say, oh, this is the original one, that's the original one, whatever. But uh, that I don't know, I'm not an expert. But the thing that I do know is that the term Myanmar was imposed by the government, it wasn't an elected government, and people were punished. It was viewed as seditious or whatever to use the term Burma or Burmese uh, because the government had imposed it and right, might is right. Okay, so this is like you're with us or against us, you're for us or against us, right? This is a totalitarian government in 19, whenever they did it, 1989 or 90 or 91 or whenever it was. So Aung San Suu Kyi is under house arrest and the country's name has changed to Myanmar, and you better use the word Myanmar. Well, if anybody says that to me, I, you know, no, sorry guys, you know. So that's why I use the term Burma. What is, what is offensive about Burma? Uh, oh. You're not mentioning that. I see it, there are political sympathies there. Yes. Burma uh, originally referred to the, entire, uh, uh, to the entire country. Myanmar, as far as I understand it, refers only to the Burmas. The, people, well, the dominant ethnic group, and when they reduced it to Myanmar, they reduced it to their nomenclature. Well, they, and, and there's arguments about that. They would say, no, that's the whole country and the other, I mean, there's arguments, but basically, to use the term Myanmar is to, is to, which is the formal name of the country now, UN, blah, 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 is to, is to say yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, to some general, you know, no thank you. You know, so that was my response. So, and it was also a declaration. You see, I thought that I wouldn't ever get into the country again after the book came out, because I would be formally a person who had written about the country. But it changed just before the book was published. And so, in fact, I've had a, a book party in Rangoon. Unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't Im have imagined that when I set out to do the book, that things would evolve to that point where that could happen. But there's still fighting in the, on the edges, and it's not, you know, it's, it's got, there's a lot of bumps in the road, you know, so it's uh, really interesting, but I urge you to try and go there if you have any chance ever, go have a look, don't expect it to suit you, just expect it to be interesting, okay, and figure out how to make it suit you. But you, what you're saying is Myanmar comes from the ethnic word, it's a political statement, and it's like uh, we have a Bumiputra. We well, sort of, I mean, but, but different people will say different things about it. So mostly, I, it's really mostly that I, I just think, I just chose to not uh, do the thing that, you know, people, so they use the term Myanmar as an adjective, as, a, as an adverb, as a, you know, it's, it's very ugly. So I just think Burma, Burmese, I go on doing that. And now people are free to say Burmese. And now when you walk down the street, you can talk to somebody in Myanmar and they will use the term Burmese and not be anxious, but before they get <coughs> there. Well, that's... Myanmar is the name of a tribe, right? No, Myan no? no it's, it's actually, uh, that's all, it's, uh, it's probably the same as, yeah, as Bamar. It's, 
it's in dispute. The name of the of the dominant ethnic group is is Myanmar is Myanmar people, which can be said Myanmar people. It can. It's so it leaves out the, the large minorities that Burma has. It leaves those people out, whereas Burma encompassed all. Was of was a, a, was a name that referred to the whole thing. So it's, but it's a, uh, it's very. Um, what I say, there are people who would argue with that interpretation and say, no, 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 Myanmar is meant to mean the whole country. I mean, you know, history is written by the victors, and for the longest time, the victors were, were the military, and it continues to be a bit of a navigated, a space that's complicated to navigate, is that I guess I would say. Yep. Any this, other questions? This has been a freely interactive session, but please go ahead and ask yeah, further questions if you, <laughs> if you have. Uh, we are uh, slowly running out of time. Well, you have plenty of time. Uh, oh, we oh, do? Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and uh, I want uh, Naomi to refer to a bit, is that she often talks, and this is what has struck me, she often talks about traveling with the joy of not knowing. And the joy of not knowing, I think, has really driven her to all these, uh, uh, to us, distant lands and uh, peoples. Uh, can you uh, talk to us a bit about that um, uh, motto? Sure. Uh, you know, um, I don't know how you feel about, about it, but I know that when, uh, when I'm asked to be an, an expert, you know, either, you know, writing something or, it makes me uncomfortable because I can never be as expert, for example, about the food of, of Burma as someone who grew up with it is. I'm, I'm an outsider and I'm trying to transmit that. And similarly, when I come in, I'm not anxious about what I, what I don't know. I enjoy what I don't know because why? It's a pleasure because then I get to find out and I get to ask questions and I get to be curious. And if I thought I was carrying around a big carton of things that I know, it would be burdensome. Instead, I have the lightness of being, which is, there's all these things I don't know. My pack sack is empty. And, and what, and it's, really, it's really a different way of going about things. So I'm never anxious about not knowing. And, and if someone says something here that I, I mean, there's allusions. We've been, I've been in conversation with all kinds of people, some of you and other people. And I'm, here I am in India, and I have some small understanding of some things in India. And there's probably things that are mentioned that I probably should know about, and I don't. And the, quick, the trick is to not be embarrassed to not know. To say, oh, what's that? Or what's that name? Oh, what does that mean? Oh, I missed that. I didn't know about that. Just be at ease with not knowing. And once you're at ease with not knowing, then you can start enjoying not knowing. So when I travel, what I carry with me is this feeling, this pleasure. Uh, in not knowing and in having all this lovely blank space to sort of fill in. Um, and it never gets filled in because the more you go somewhere, the more you realize how little you know. So it's, it, this blank space keeps growing. It's a really a fabulous thing. I think that's particularly important for us Indians because we always feel like we know everything. Um, so is, that really, is that really so? That's really so. Is that a really. piece of the culture? <laughs> is, that, really so. is that what you learn in school? Is that yeah, how you no. get... Is no, that no, how you when deal I, with it? When, 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 when I go out, there are always people asking me about my country and where I come from. But in India, I've noticed, especially in trains and elsewhere, people always want to tell people from outside about their country and about themselves and how great this country is and how great we are or whatever. But very few people ask people, where are you from? What is it? Uh, what do you eat? What do you do? What do you think? That's what I mean. The other thing, uh, any more questions, as I said, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, the other, the last thing that I wanted to ask you was, uh, you said uh, uh, just before we started that I rely on good luck, mm -hmm. and that uh, works for you uh, as you travel across. Is that part of your plan, good luck? Well, I, I guess I just rely on what comes, and uh, so that means, hmm, yeah. So I think of it as good luck because that's the optimist way of thinking of it. Um, but uh, I don't have an agenda when I go except to try and slow down and not get impatient. Because I can have, if I'm there, for example, and I'm anxious about my soups chapter, let's say, or, you know, I'm sort of, I'm getting close, to, it's maybe my last trip before I have to get the manuscript in, and I'm realizing all the gaps I have. So at that point, I could think, gosh, I haven't learned anything today. You know, I, nothing's happened. I haven't, well, what to do? Well, the fact that I haven't learned anything today is also something I've learned, you know. Why was that? What what went on? Well, other things happened, um, but I didn't get you know I didn't fill my slot you know or 
whatever. So uh, that's, I can't really. I think uh, the, the great thing about uh, mm -hmm. sort of writing that you do yeah, yeah. seems to be an impressionistic well, it is. idea of food, which is it's, really not intimidating. When, you well, know, when, when yes, cooks write, right. you know, they talk from on high. And you know it's very intimidating to put one pinch of the you know. Uh, you but know, this is this is instructions. This tells you what to do. But I'm but I'm learning. But I'm trying to learn as a beginner. Again, this thing. If you have an empty mind, I'm not coming in saying, "Well, I know everything." I yeah. certainly don't. I'm familiar. I was familiar with a lot of the ingredients in the market because of having spent time in this country and in Bangladesh and in Thailand. And so the you know the vegetables. Of it, most of that was familiar. Uh, just how people used it wasn't familiar. So that's a start. But I'm always building from zero. And so when I try and have the recipes also be available to you, starting from zero. Um, so that, that, and then the good luck thing, you, you also make your luck, and one of the ways you make your luck if you're, is to travel by yourself, point one, really important. Um, or maybe travel with a kid. But traveling by yourself, you're available to other people. And then not to be needy, not to think that the place owes you anything, and then to be prepared to strike up conversation with anybody. Again, not needily, just be available. And then if they don't want to talk to you, well, so what? They don't want to talk to you. Don't feel that, it's not like, oh gosh, do I dare talk to that guy? Well, what's the worst thing that can happen? The guy brushes you off, so what? Right, no big deal. And you get into a train compartment and you think, oh, I hope I have conversation, I'm feeling lonely. No, that's not a good thing to think. You just go into the train compartment, be prepared to have a conversation. Maybe you're in some with a motor mouth and you can't stand it, drives you crazy. Well, that's the chance you took. Or maybe you're with people who are really uptight and just won't talk to you. Well, that's also interesting. But you can't need them to be in any way. You, you know, that's that's what I talk about. That's that's luck. It's just being of a temperament that you can cope with those differences. So I just want to end with two things. One is that uh, you know, if you have the time later on, just talk to her about her travels in Iran, Azerbaijan, and all that area. They're fascinating. And the second thing I want to say is uh, this, uh, the question of the joy of not knowing. That certainly drives her, but I took her the other day to Panjim market, and we went through everything, including the fish market. But she refused to go to the dry fish market. So there's a limit to her joy. Uh, no, 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 no. You know why we didn't go to the dry fish market? Because he said, I can't go to the dry fish market. He said, because if we do, I'll buy too much. I accommodated him. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much.